So with that, thank you. And uh, thank you for giving us the talk today. All right, yeah, thanks for the intro. Yeah, yeah, thank you all for coming. So today I'm gonna to be talking about uh, basically how to do reinforcement learning for robotics, uh, at least from my point of view. And this talk is called Focusing on Past Relevant Information and Reinforcement Learning for Robotics. So um, the goal here, I think, for our research lab is to increase robotic autonomy. Now, autonomy is like a very vague word. It just kind of means independence. So when I think about autonomy, I'm thinking about uh, with respects to like tasks. So like maybe at test time, your task is slightly changing or you don't have like an idea of what tasks to do. Um, you probably want your robot to adapt and handle like changing task distributions. So let's look at this axis of autonomy, uh, starting from left to right. So at the low end of autonomy, like with respect to this uh, task setting, we have like factories. So in factories, the like task is well known in advance. You have a lot of um, like heavy supervision from like professional roboticists and programmers and people who are whose full time job is basically to take care of the robot and make sure that it's doing its task correctly. And also the like environment and task distribution is well known. So like these robots are extremely autonomous, like they're very independent, but they can only do their like prescribed tasks, which is like this battery taking place, right? Um, so another setting that's somewhere in the middle um, is what I would call like home settings. So in home settings, there's definitely less supervision. The peep, there are still people that can like help the robot out, but they're, for example, everyday adults and their full-time jobs are not to help out the robots. And also the um, environments and tasks are less known in advance. So you just see here, like in this uh, GIF, the robots are being assigned to like, just, uh, you know, clean up the floor, clean up the table. And the kind of objects that they're seeing can be like changing throughout their lifetime, right? So we don't know exactly like um, what objects are being are being placed in that house uh, in advance. Like we need to adapt to it like uh, during the test time. And finally, in the most uh, general setting, which is just like any setting. So for example, like space exploration or something, you might not even have super supervision from like um, I don't know, expert robotics, right? Just because since the robot is like light years away. Um, the robot needs to be autonomous and um, figure out how to um, adapt to like um, the test time distribution without relying on like human, human supervision. And here we might not know anything about the environment's made priority. And um, yeah, I feel like space exploration is a very common uh, common thing that people always point to, and it it really is a dream. Like I'd say we're somewhere here still. Uh, we're somewhere here, like with respect to where we um, currently are in robotics. So we're somewhere in between like factory and home settings. We're still struggling to get like the idea of a a uh, very general household robot out into homes and that generalist robot can like learn to do all uh, different sorts of tasks and stuff like that. Um, and the common question that uh, I think the robotics community has is just like, how can we push ourselves to the, um, to the left-hand side, right? So how can we make our robots more autonomous? You wouldn't say like the rovers on Mars are autonomous? No, I don't. Because like they require like, you know, an entire team like NASA engineers to like carefully plan out every single move to make sure that, you know, if it gets stuck in a crater, it's able to get out again. Um, and there's just um, a lot of things that you still have to do to, um, like, supervise the robot and make sure that it doesn't, like, destroy itself, right? Um, yeah, so, like, this is just an incomplete picture. Um, so, for example, space exploration actually might be a very easy task because all you're doing is you just need to, like, navigate around. And you actually don't need to, like, think about, like, landing on a planet and then, like, maybe that planet has some unseen physics or something. So I'm just, like, using these examples are just like high level uh, caricatures of the problems I'm talking about. So like, um, yeah, I think uh, as part of GRASP, like we, we all are pretty interested in learning. So like uh, the robotics community has been very interested in using learning in the past few years. Um, basically with all the advances in like deep learning and machine learning in general, it seemed like a very promising way to um, improve robotics, right? Because if you somehow put learning into your robotics framework, and the idea is that your uh, robot can like learn from its own experiences. It can uh, self-improve and adapt. And that's actually a very key like property for like adapting to new environments. It seems like learning is the uh, most elegant and simple way to address this. Okay. So there is a major source of friction in the robotics community. So like there's a lot of old school roboticists who just go like these new school like learning folks, like especially the reinforcement learning people just coming in and saying like, you know, we basically have this camera like learning and we're just gonna like solve every problem. We've already done it for like other problems like CV, NLP, biotech, like robotics is just like, you know, a matter of time. And this was like, I think it started around in like 20, 2014, 2015. And, uh, you know, it's 2023 and I'd say like that, that is like nowhere near like uh, enough to, to like actually um, have a big impact on robots, right? 
So like, um, you know, in robotics, we, we know that like, uh, you know, like learning is extremely experience intensive and the robots need lots of data to like learn tasks and adapt to the new environments. So clearly just approaching this as like, you like approaching this from a learning perspective, I would say is not enough. Um, we have to consider some other things that are like very special about robotics to get learning to work. So yeah, the general question of like the robot learning, you know, community is just like, how can we apply learning to robotics in a way that's more just like big data end to end, you know, learning all the way, right? So before I get to that, I'm going to first like formalize some things about reinforcement learning. So first, uh, there's this idea of like a perception action loop in robotics. And there's also an idea of Markov decision processes in reinforcement learning. And I'm just going to show you that they're like pretty much the same thing. So here's a Markov decision process. It looks very vague. It's like a four tuple object where you have um, the state space S, action space A. You have some dynamics function that tells you the probability of the next state S prime given the current state in action. And you also have a reward function. That's like a function of the um, states, next states, and it's going to output a number. And usually you try to maximize this in reinforcement learning. So like here's a perception action loop that we often see in robotics. So basically you have a robot that's going to emit an action A into the world. And the world's going to give you like the next state or next observation as prime and also a reward signal. And in reinforcement learning, it's all about just finding a policy, which is a mapping from state to actions. Um, so that policy is going to output actions to maximize your rewards over time. So like this is just an equation saying that um, we want to find a policy pi such that uh, the action that is outputting will result in rewards. And you're trying to maximize this like reward scaling. And you can see where it fits in the perception action loop is like um, it's just how you how the robot decides to make actions. So like as input, it gets it gets an S state S and it's going to output an action A. And an optimal policy will output actions that max the one. Okay. So the problem with RL is that it's very experience intensive. Um, RL theory says that the number of samples you need to get an optimal policy scales exponentially with the state space and action space, right? So um, just off the bat already, I said robots, it's slow to collect data, things like that. But how can we use RL to actually train robots? That's kind of like the big question. So the kind of key takeaway of this talk is to do so, you're going to have to focus learning on the relevant parts of your problem. So in an RL specific thing, I mean, uh, well, in an RL specific uh, language, I mean, do learning for the right parts of the MVP. So some examples we can think of is like, um, given a task, we can consider like the spatial properties of the MVP. So what parts of the scene are task relevant? Perhaps we should somehow focus our learning on those parts of the scene. Um, given a task, what kind of rewards are we given to like uh, learn to accomplish that task? Is there some way for us to get even more informative rewards? And finally, like, um, you know, even if we don't know the task in advance, um, is there some way for our robot to still like discover the space of tasks and um, like do autonomous learning without like a human exactly specifying the task up front? So by doing these, uh, so like by doing reinforcement learning and asking these kinds of questions when you're designing the reinforcement learning algorithm itself, I'm going to show you that we can get uh, RL policies that can control new robots, overcome like vague visual reward specifications, and do unsupervised task discovery. And the, the main thing is like um, these reinforcement learning policies, the way we acquire them is much more data efficient than just viewing all these columns as a generic MPP and just doing like uh, reinforcement learning end to end uh, without considering any of this kind of uh, properties that we want from the problem. Okay, so that leads into the first work. Uh, so it's about controlling new robots by learning uh, spatially disentangled models. So this is joint work with Huan Huang, Oleg Rukin, and Dinesh Jao. So first, I'm just going to talk about learning visual dynamics models for model-based RL. You can't see it too well. But um, for those of you familiar with like MPC, this is, I'm just going to describe basically doing um, model predictive control with a learned dynamics model. So let's say uh, in the in the scene, we have like a RGB observation of the scene. So here we can see the robot and like a piece of cloth that's trying to manipulate. And our goal is to move that piece of cloth to the left. So one way of approaching this control problem is to decompose it into like a dynamics, dynamics and planning problem. So the dynamics problem is we first want to learn like, um, for example, a video prediction model that predicts future video frames given actions. And then at test time, we're gonna sample actions and uh, forecast their outcomes. So what this means is like, um, 
I'm going to be sampling options like move left, move right, move down for the robot. And then with that video prediction model, it's going to uh, give me some uh, future predictive frames. And then we'll just use some cost function to select the like uh, image or the like the forecasted image that looks more closely, that looks the most close to my goal image. So here, uh, like the, the predicted move left image looks the most close to my goal. So then I'm going to choose uh, the move left action. Yeah, like this. So that was a quick sketch of how to do like control with the visual dynamics model. Um, and the high level idea is to just learn visual dynamics models from experience to assist with like control. And this has been done a lot in prior work. Um, yeah, so some names for it is like visual foresight, visual MPC, or even visual model based RL, but they're all really just doing the same thing learning a like video prediction model and then uh, doing control over that. So, one problem with these uh, prediction models is they require like up to a few days to collect the amount of data you need to train them, right? Um, so for example, like let's say I was doing this kind of a uh, control on a Widow X. So I like collected a bunch of videos on this Widow X robot that's seen at my desk. And let's say I damaged a Widow X. So like what I did was like I damaged the link. So I replaced the link with like this longer silver link. I also added like some kind of April tag or some kind of bumpers to it. So basically I modified the Widow X. Or let's just say like I decided to upgrade my robot entirely. So from a Widow X, I changed to like a Franco Panda robot. So if I deploy my video prediction model that was originally trained on the Widow X to these like new robots, we're going to get very poor generalization. So you can see here that the uh, video prediction of the robot is like really bad. So like at test time, we have this uh, white Franco Panda. But what the video prediction model is predicting is this uh, training time black widow X. Furthermore, the object movement is very, very bad. So you can see that there, it's like not even moving. It's it's like halfway moving, but in reality, it should really be predicting that they're like sliding to the um, sliding to my left or I guess you're right. Yeah. So these visual models don't transfer to new robots out of the box. And the way we usually address this from like the big data perspective, just to collect more data on a new robot in the fine chain. So that naturally leads to open this question. Can we train uh, like transferable visual dynamics models? Because then we wouldn't have to do this retraining every time we get a new robot or even just alter the robot. So first, I'm just going to set up two mechanisms um, for uh, set up yeah, two mechanisms for our method. So the first mechanism we're going to use is robot segmentation. So robot segmentation is just the act of um, getting a binary segmentation mask from the image that tells you what pixels belong to the robot and what pixels do not. And this is pretty easy to get when you have proprioception. So like your joint angles and also camera calibration. So you know how to project your uh, camera pixels into 3D space. And then the second piece is robot dynamics. So, um, so given the kinematics of the robot, I can actually pretty easily predict how the robot will move in the future. So an example is like if I have end effector uh, displacement as my actions, I'm doing like position control on a, a linked robot, I can run like inverse and forward kinematics to get a good estimate of uh, what the future robot state will be if I were to do this um, end effector displacement. So now I'm going to introduce the uh, our method, like robot over control. And the high level idea is to disentangle the robot from the stuff we want to move in the world. So in the first step, we're going to learn a robot aware model from videos of the robot R1. So like R1 is our training time robot, like this little X. We just collect a bunch of videos of it, and we're going to train this uh, dynamics model. And you can see that this dynamics model is uh, composed of two parts, an analytical robot model and a learned um, learn world model. I'll get more into details about this shortly. But basically, the idea is that uh, in the second step, so during testing time, when we're transferring like to a new robot R2, we can actually just swap out this uh, analytical robot with the test time robots analytical model. And then we just reuse that world model we learned. And then we can run, we can basically, uh, yeah, run a round of planning and then get uh, some good test time execution on the new robot without having to update our like neural network on the um, new robot. So diving into the details of the first part, which is the dynamics model. So first, uh, into this dynamics model, we're going to feed in an image of the like robot in the world, but with the robot masked out. So really, all we care about is the world pixels. So that's going to include like objects and yeah, non-robot pixels. Basically. We're also going to feed in the actions, and we're also going to feed in like the current robot state. And one interesting thing here is that um, we have access to this analytical robot model. So once again, this is like, for example, the forward and inverse kinematics of a linked robot. 
or if it's not a linked robot, maybe you have like a motion planner, but just something that can help give you like good estimates of how the robot will move over time. And we can actually use that to get um, a future robot state, our prime. And this doesn't need to be like perfect, it's just an estimate. But the point is this estimate, we can plug back into the learned world model. And we think that like basically, uh, we're basically leveraging our like known knowledge here to uh, predict something about the future. And then we're gonna feed that, in, feed that back into the neural network as a very useful feature uh, to do prediction on. And then kind of the, the key thing about our method here is that when we do do prediction, we are predicting like the next image, but we're actually only, we're, we're training the network to just predict the world regions. So like basically through this loss, we're just uh, enforcing like L2 loss over the pixels of the world. So this neural network is actually not being trained to like reconstruct the robot or uh, predict how the robot will move because how the robot moves is all like uh, already done by this analytical robot. Um, so really what this neural network is learning is like optic dynamics. And uh, yeah. object dynamics with respect to the actions of the robot. Yes. Which you know in the world model. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and like, uh, I guess one assumption here is we're working with like manipulation robots and we're assuming the action space is very similar to robots. So that is like one assumption. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. So once again, um, at test time, we're going to, we're going to swap out this analytical model with like the analytical model of, our, of the robot we have actually at test time. Right. So uh, the second part is a uh, robot aware planning cost. So we need a cost function to do planning. So once again, it, it gives us like a measure of how close that future predicted trajectory is to the goal image. So let's just say I have like a goal image with just like the object in it because I'm trying to specify a manipulation task. Um, the thing is, if I just take like L2 pixel distance between this um, object only goal image and the scene with a robot in it, that robot will like dominate the planning cost. So it's gonna act like as a source of noise. But um, what we can do instead is just apply the same velocity where we separate, where we just separate out the robot from the world using our binary segmentation mask. And we just want to compute the cost only over the world phases. Because once again, our manipulation tasks are just about moving objects. So we should just compute the distances over the objects and ignore the robot. Okay. So the main hypothesis here is that doing robot aware dynamics and uh, doing this robot aware cost will, en will enable better prediction and control on new robots. So we validate our approach on a number of like manipulation tasks with like these six different robots. We have like Sawyer, Baxter, the Panda, the Widow X, the Widow X 200, and like a modified version of the 200. And I'll highlight our most like extreme case of robot transfer. So in this setting, we only have access to one robot at training time. And basically I have around 2000 videos, of, which is like 15 hours of random interaction data of this Widow X 200. Um, and then I just, uh, transfer directly into the frankness. So just like that um, case I highlighted earlier where there was like very poor generalization in the baseline video prediction model. Um, and you can basically see like here are the actual rollouts of the plans. Um, you can see that uh, only the RAC, robot aware control method, is able to achieve this goal image of this watermelon push. Whereas like the baselines are doing the end-to-end, -end, um, like the yeah, end-to-end -end learning uh, kind of fail. And they fail because they have poor prediction, like poor generalization of those dynamics and also their cost consciousness. And just some, some more quantitative results. So from just training on one robot, um, RNC outperforms like this end to end uh, visual foresight baseline without like a robot aware model and robot aware cost. You can see that the baseline gets like zero out of like 20 or 30 in all their trials. Um, we also outperform like a domain adaptation baseline with privileged access to uh, 12,000 images of the robot at test time. So this baseline is actually designed to like try to adapt to the test time robot. We still outperform those. Uh, we outperform like baseline, we, we outperform um, ablations where we like ablate like the robot aware model and the robot aware cost. And finally, like one natural question people have is like, if you're in the end to end learning camp, you will say that uh, there wasn't enough data because you only trained on one robot, the model cannot generalize. So we also uh, did a multi robot case. I think we trained on like four or five different robots. And what we find is like the end to end learning methods of basically this uh, BF plus state. Um, it does get better. So it jumps from like 0 out of 30 to 11 out of 30. So it does improve with more diverse data. But you can see that it's, it's still pretty poor. Um, perhaps we need to collect even more data for it. Um, and you can see that um, our robot order control method also scales accordingly. So you can just see like uh, by paying attention to like the correct parts of the scene and paying attention to the correct parts of the dynamics, like what needs to be learned and what doesn't need to be learned, we can get pretty good performance over just the like baseline end-to-end -end methods. Is the... Multi-robot training 
include the Franco? No. So like the these these robots are unseen at uh, during training. Yeah. Can you run it from end to end on the Franco to see how well it would do on that side? Like, like directly without generalization and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I think it would do well. Would do yeah, because I think this uh problem setting is about adapting to the robots. Yeah. yeah. Um, we also have like few shot. We also have, yeah, so we actually, yeah, you're right. So we, we have a few shot experiments where we give it like a very limited amount of uh, like video data from the test time robot, like the Franca, and we still outperform them. But like both methods do get better. I just think like our, like we're like the assumptions we're making are, are like very good for robot transfer, which is about like modeling the world and not needing to model the like robot. The robot so. Yeah, whereas the end to end learning methods need to learn, like relearn all the like robot dynamics. So you have the dynamics of all the robots you're transferring to. Um, yes. So like, um, usually it just means we know the forward and inverse of kinematics. That's it. Okay. So um, so just like some examples. So like here's like the uh, video prediction results. So you can see that like the baseline model, like once again, it's just like outputting the training time robot instead of moving the like cranked up arm. And you can see that um, the octopus that's pushing is like uh, it's turning into a blob and it's not really moving down. You can see that ours, like the octopus, is still a blob, but just move down more. <laughs> yeah, and like these, these map, these differences in like, uh, like object movement, like it does matter a lot for the planning. Um, and so you can see, like in a basically in pick and place tasks, uh, having accurate plans is really important. So the baseline policy, um, it's able to get like a rough initial grasp, but just like its planning quality due to like the dynamics is like bad due to bad dynamics. Really. Um, it can't really plan on like very stable and uh, accurate graphs, whereas like our policy is able to do pick in place uh, on this new robot. And just like one more cool thing is just um, because we have that robot aware cost, if as long as we can segment out like whatever is um, not the world with the world, for example, like we have a human goal image, we can just like run some like human like human post detection algorithm to get the human hand mask and then like uh, segment that out. And then just run the user robot aware cost to give a like planning cost for the bear movement, then we can just um, achieve human goal. All right, so I just talked about like spatially disentangled models where we focus on the like task relevant portions of the perception. And uh, one interesting twist I like you to think about is the reward function. Because usually the reward function you use for uh, updating your policies, right? But you can also think about the reward function as another form of perception. So if the reward function is another form of perception where you're perceiving rewards, that leaves open a question like, can we do things to improve our perception of the reward? So this is what I'm going to talk about in the uh, the next in the next work. So, so yeah, it's called resolving ambiguous rewards through environmental interaction. So this is a joint work with Quan Huang and Dinesh Charaman. So some of the authors from the previous work, and this was presented at Coral. So let's. Let's motivate this with a very simple uh, task. So, like, I want you to think about closing and locking a door. Right? So, if you close and lock a door, like maybe especially like if you get a car door, if you're like me, we would probably try to, you know, um, try to open the door again just to make sure that we actually locked it. Right. So, there's like some kind of form of we, we want to try to like interactively, uh, interactively verify that the door is locked. And like, what's interesting about this is we're we're using like the physical interaction of this object to reveal the true state of the door. So in this talk, we're like, in this talk, we're trying to answer like, how, how should we teach a robot to accomplish this, right? So do some kind of like physical interaction to reveal the states. Okay, so first, what's like the typical way of like um, specifying a task to a robot? So what we normally do is like, if you want a robot to do this kind of uh, door closing, door closing task, we will just like uh, hand specify some kind of Engineered reward function. So, um, if you've ever done RL, you know that the more, basically, the more lines of code you have in a reward function, the better, probably. Like uh, having a very dense reward is really good, but it takes a lot of time to like craft these kinds of reward functions. And let's say you change the task slightly, right? Then you'll have to like code an entirely new reward function. So, it's not a very scalable approach. So, there is a, a framework called exemplar rewards or example based rewards. Where what the what the designer does is like the RL designer does not need to code a reward function. Instead, they just need to provide like image snapshots of what the task looks like when it's been completed. Right. So we call these exemplar rewards. So in the door locking case, maybe I'll provide an image of the door closed. 
Maybe in another task, I want to close the water bottle fully. I'll give you an image of the water bottle with the cap fully closed. So what this changes, so what this kind of changes is like uh, you need to view, um, you need to view the reward function as like um, a form of perception because in order to actually uh, like utilize these images as the reward, what we're doing is we're going to train like a discriminator d of zero, right? D of O. That will like take in the image and uh, output like plus one or zero. Like basically, if if it belongs in the positive uh, positive class or negative class. And the reinforcement learning policy's job is try to alter the environment so that the uh, you know image of the environment uh, matches closely with the image positives, right? So we're using like a discriminator. Um, we're we're training a discriminator to estimate the reward. But one but one thing here is like uh, since the discriminator is like this passive perception, like this perce perception based reward, um, is it always reliable to like um, is it always reliable to perceive the reward like for any task? So the answer is no, like per perceiving task rewards is very hard. So in this example, like I show you an image of a closed door, but can you tell me if it's actually locked or not, right? Or like uh, I show you this image of a bottle cap, is it actually fully tightened or is it like maybe a little bit loose? We just don't know. But what we can show is that um, by, by like, you know, physically interacting with these objects, we can, um, we can basically figure out if they're actually locked or unlocked or if they're actually loose or tight, right? So that's kind of the key idea of our framework. It's um, if we can train, like can we train interactive reward function policies that interactively evaluate the task policy outcomes? So once again, like instead of having that discriminator, we might have a policy that actually interacts with these doors or bottle caps and like outputs the reward instead of just relying on pure like passive perception to output the rewards data. Yeah, so how do we train these though? So the, the way we're gonna train these is to move move beyond uh, image like image snapshots. Um, we're gonna do something called actionable examples. So here, here's like the snapshots of the images, right? So these are just images. But uh, instead we're gonna have a more, yeah, more interesting actionable positive. So like these are like real physical objects that the robots can interact with. So these are no longer just like images of the lot board. We're going to actually give the robots like locked doors and fully closed water bottles. And the idea is for the interactive reward function to learn a sequence of actions that will reveal if these actionable examples are actually like uh, locked or not, or if it's fully tight or not. Um, and yeah, so once again, this is an assumption of our, our project. We need to, we need the human user to actually provide these actionable uh, positives, right? And we're going to be learning these kind of uh, disambiguating actions through reinforcement. Okay, so how does that fit in with the exemplar, uh, like the exemplar reward framework? Well, we just simply replace those um, image-based positives with these actionable positives. And then instead of doing the passive perception with that uh, discriminator, D of, D of O, we're going to run around an interactive perception with the um, IRF or interactive reward function policy to estimate the reward. So, so in other words, this is like the policy that will learn to like push open the door or flip the water bottle to give you a, to give you a, an estimate of the reward for task completion. Okay, so how do we train the IRF policy? So we already have like um, positive examples of successful outcomes from the human user, such as like locked doors. And in addition to this, we're gonna get negative examples from the initial task policy. So these, so these are basically like the outcomes of the uh, suboptimal task policy, and they may look very visually similar to the positive actionable examples, but um, they are not actually positive. So like, remember, if you just optimize that, um, that image of the door being locked, the, the policy might close the door, but not lock it. So like, these are the kind of negative examples we're working with. And the idea is we're gonna run like the RF policy on these actionable examples. So we're gonna have to play around with these actionable examples. And once it's done playing around with like an actionable example, we're gonna look at the last, um, we're gonna look at the last image from that trajectory, O of T. And then the idea is that um, if the actionable example came from the negative, from the negative set, then the this O of T should make it very apparent. It should look very apparent that it belongs in the negative set. So and like vice versa for the positive set. So just outputting a sequence of actions to modify the examples in a way that reveals their true class label. So for example, in the door in the door uh, locking case. Um, a set of actions that would reveal that would reveal these labels would be to attempting would be to like open the door. If, 
the door came from the negative set, then when you attempt to open the door, then your O of T, like the last image, would be like an image of the door fully open. Um, whereas, like um, here, if you attempt to open the locked door from the positive set, it's going to remain closed. And like these images look very different. Right? So it's very easy to classify if they belong in the negative or positive set. Okay, so once we train this IRF, IRF policy, we can just use this um, to get the true task reward, right? And so we basically replace that discriminator with this IRF policy. And uh, what we do is we just uh, train, on, train another task policy with this IRF reward. And that task policy is called learning from interactive word function policy. So learn task policy for short. And basically this policy should be a lot better than that initial task policy because we're training it on a reward that's, that actually is like accurate with respect to the task. And uh, one bonus thing is that um, we can still use the IRF policy at test time as like an in-the-loop verification behavior. So what this means is we're going to run the task policy, and then uh, we're going to run the IRF policy to check if it thinks the uh, task policy has completed or not. If it hasn't completed, we'll just rerun it and then keep on doing this loop. What kind of networks are you using for all these different reports? Yeah, um, so the IRF policy and the like task policy are just like very simple MLPs. Like two layer MLPs. So there's is nothing special with the networks at all. Is the discriminator like a CNN or something? So, yeah, usually in an uh, image based reward, you're going to use the CNN. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good point. So because um, because we're doing interactive perception, which modifies the state, we can only use this reward uh, once per episode. So we're going to use it as like a sparse reward at the end of the episode. So that is like, uh, yeah, that is like an assumption we're making here that, you know, we, we're going to use this as a sparse reward. If you use it in the middle of execution, it would it might like alter the state and therefore destroy the like destroy the progress you're making. Around that. Yeah, so you can so you can do this in simulation and reset it. Um, but the point of this is like it should work in the real world. So we don't have that assumption that we set. Okay, so for some qualitative results, um, so here's just like the uh, LERF policy, like trained on the interactive reward function reward. It's able to successfully like lock the door. Um, it's also able to do something called weighted block stacking, where you see these blocks. Um, so from the perception stream, it cannot estimate the weights of the blocks. So like uh, the green block is the heaviest, but the robot does not know that until it actually like interacts with the block to measure the weight. And what we can see is that the learn policy correctly learns to uh, just basically like try to pick up random blocks. And if it picks up the green block, it's going to put it on the bottom uh, because you want to put the green block on the bottom to make the most stable power. And what's cool is like um, actually if you just wait a bit, like um, if it detects so if it detects the green block like on top, the heaviest block on top, it's going to undo its progress to move it um, to move it to the bottom. So I think that's like a pretty cool uh, result. And finally, we have like a real real world example of like screwing, where um, just uh, because the screw is symmetrical, you can't really tell like the absolute uh, rotation of it easily. So um, so it's like similar to the door locking case where you need to like screw it to a very specific position to get it fully tightened. So just um, some quantitative results. Uh, first, we have like bytes, the original exemplar based reward. Um, you can see that it doesn't perform very well in these partially observed settings. And then we have our method, um, which correctly like addresses these partial observability problems um, in these tasks. Uh, running like the learn plus verify, where you like run the interactive reward function one more round um, after the learn policy execution further improves the performance. Um, and we're also careful to, uh, we also like, we're, we're careful to compare the baseline with extra privileged information just to give us like a sense of like how good our algorithm is. Um, so we have like um, GIFO, which uses like demonstrations. We have a manually engineered uh, like reward function that will like manually perturb the scene. Um, so, and then we also have like a ground truth state reward. So this, so this baseline gets to see like the true state of the task. And we can see that like our method is pretty competitive even with these baselines with like extra assumptions. Um, yeah, so I think like this is a this is a cool method. Um, yeah, so one thing with ground truth state reward is like um, I think it's so like even though we have the ground truth state, like because of reward engineering, like the, the tasks it's actually some of them are hard to make a really good optimal reward. 
So like, for example, this, I might be using like the L2 distance or like a Boolean for the lock, but like even, even with this kind of reward engineering, uh, it might not be the perfect reward. Number, right. So just because I have the like access to the state doesn't mean like I can craft the like best reward number process. So that might be one reason why this isn't like the like 100% like super strong baseline to see. So um, just very quickly, um, we can see that the, what the IRF policy learns to do is like in the door locking case, it learns to try to like hug the door open to reveal if it was locked or not. Um, in the block stacking case, it learns to uh, like very gently poke the block power because if the block power is stable, it's not gonna fall over, but if it was unstable, it's gonna fall over. And in the screwing case, it's just going to try to like lightly tap the screw to make sure that's fully tight. So this LERP framework like shows us how to get better reward signals for a given task. But uh, maybe one question, maybe one question or assumption we have here is like uh, this task is like given to us in advance. Um, what about like in environments where we don't have as much information about the task? Like in the worst case, uh, we're just like dropped into an environment with no information about the task, and we're going to get the task at test time. So what should we do in like that case? So that's where like this next uh, this next work comes in. Um, it's about discovering tasks and mastering them with no supervision. So like I just mentioned, this is the setting of unsupervised task discovery. So in unsupervised task discovery, what we first do is we drop an agent into an unknown environment. So for example, we have like some household robot and we might bring it into a new kitchen. And what, we're, what we want the robot to do is first undergo a round of exploration where it figures out like what can be done in the environment and like how to do it. So maybe we want the household robot to just like, you know, try to open random doors, um, figure out like how to use tools, things like this. Um, and then, and then after the exploration phase, we're going to undergo an evaluation phase where we set like some arbitrary new task environment. So like after a day of letting my robot mess up my house and figure out like what things are, what things are openable and whatnot, I'm going to, maybe I'll ask it to like uh, clean up the kitchen table, right? I'll just like set some random new task for it. So it's clear here that like uh, the more diverse exploration experience the robot gathers in that initial exploration phase, um, the like the wider variety of skills we can potentially learn from that data set, right? So it's going to become a more generalist agent. So let's talk about task discovery and goal condition RL. So in goal condition RL, you want to train an agent, this high of G, to reach any specified goal G. So notice like in this uh, policy, it's conditioned on an additional variable uh, G, right? So the idea here is that we're going to uh, define the notion of a task in this setting as a reaching a goal state G, okay? Um, so, so first, like, I'm gonna talk about a very powerful concept in like goal condition RL. Uh, it's called like go explore cell exploration. So basically what you do is in go explore exploration, you're, you're trying to choose like um, a goal variable G. So it's like some goal state and you wanna choose it and then use the goal condition policy of the robot to like move to it. And then, so the robot's going to try to attempt to like reach its goal state, and it may or may not reach near it, depending on the optimality of the goal, goal condition controller. So it's going to reach some state S of T, right? And then at S of T, we're going to launch an exploration policy. So this is like some controller that's like designed to explore um, the environment. And then we're going to record this entire trajectory in the data set B with like the labeled rewards. And then we're going to improve the policy on this uh, on this data set and reset. So this is like very similar to like frontier based exploration of robotics, where basically you're trying to get to the edge of like your known, of your like your known state space and then do exploration from there. So it's clear that we should like set diverse goals, right? So we want to set goals that are like far away from the robot uh, to like, uh, to find like diverse data. But like one thing is like, how do we reason about, like how do we reason about setting diverse goals? So for example, like are these goals plausible? So have, have I seen them before in my like data distribution? Should I just be setting my goals to be very familiar states, unfamiliar states? Okay, if they're unfamiliar, can I actually reach them or not? Right. So there's like a lot of considerations on uh, what like what it means to set a diverse goal. So really, the definition of like diverse goal is pretty fuzzy. So this leaves open this general question of like how should an agent choose goals to maximize exploration? And just real quick, mm -hmm. for this goal, um, so you get to the goal and then you continue. So you have to kind of break the the standard RL cycle of like you hitting a done on an episode. Yeah. Um. So not exactly. So just in a single episode, you're switching between two policies: the goal condition policy and exploration policy. 
Oh, so they're separate. Okay. It's a single episode, though. Okay. Um, yeah. So, in the sense of like, I don't know, the discounted rewards to the goal and all that kind of stuff, how do you deal with these two policies? Hmm. Different parts. Yeah. So, for, for rewards, it does not. So, like, if you run off policy RL, it does not matter. Actually, um, and I think I can like once I get through the slides, maybe you'll get a better sense of how do we deal with uh, rewards like on the two policies. Yeah. Is that is it is things that you learn while following this or policy going to help you improve the the original goal? Yes. Policy? Yes. So, it, yeah. So this only probably like this probably doesn't work in some like it only works in some systems. Like if your goal is like I don't know like like push us off the table, mm -hmm. then maybe the exploration after achieving your goal isn't. Anymore. Um, so you're saying because, because like the states, the oh, states want to like yeah, yeah, yeah. So like um, I think so like basically you want to choose goals that um, lead to temporally extended exploration. So like you you have high future expected exploration. Right? So if I were to push an object off a table, and then the object's on the ground, and I predict that I cannot explore a lot from that state, then that's a bad goal. Oh, I see. Okay, so we're picking these goals mostly. This isn't going to be like the goal that like oh, I exactly. actually want this robot to do. Yeah. Like so script. yeah, yeah. So once again, the motivation is I just want to gather as big of a like data set as I can. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah, because the bigger sense. the data set, like the more coverage I get in this data set, the more like diverse skills I can learn from that data set. Um, so this is purely just how to get good training data for my robot. And do we like have so like these goals? Um, they're the same. They're just a state, right? Yeah, they're a goal so state. Yeah. Um, and so, uh. Do we know the entire uh, state set from the beginning? No, we don't, right? So like, that's why I talked about like plausibility. So it's like, um, I've, seen, I've seen a subset of this uh, state space and should I pick a goal that's like, um, you know, familiar to me, like it's su well supported by my like replay buffer or historical experience, or if I just pick a goal state that's like very, that's not supported, it's like a very unknown goal, right? So like I mentioned, like all these prior works, they have to like, they, they, they choose some kind of like definition, like. Good goals are hard to reach, or good goals are implausible. Like I haven't seen it a lot, things like that. Um, so I'm just saying, like, uh, yeah. So this is the question that like all the prior works and my works trying to answer. How do you choose the goal to maximize exploration? Okay, so okay, so like I'm saying, actually, we don't we don't need to care about all the like reachability or plausibility stuff. Um, all we really care about is um, choosing a goal that will lead my exploration. Well, that will lead the goal condition policy somewhere. Such that it's good for exploration, right? So it's good for the exploration policy type. So let me give like a more pictorial example here. So like uh, once again, you're the you're the goal picking algorithm, and then you you can choose like any you can choose any like goal state in this like MVP. Okay, and then like one one like one thing that fireworks commonly do is they want to pick goal states like here, like so like here's like my scene data distribution. I want to pick goals like around the frontier. Um, because the idea is that my robot will go somewhere like near this frontier or like even out here and find really unsafe states. But I'm saying like, we don't need to care about that. Actually, what we care about is just, we pick some goal like here. And as long as, as long as the goal, we, we just think about where the goal condition policy will end up. Like this S of T is actually the important thing. So we just need to pick some goal, like goal start here, such that when the goal condition policy is conditioned on that goal, the terminal state of the goal condition policy will land up somewhere that's very good for exploration. Let me, uh, let me show you some more details then. So, so like I just mentioned, like we want to reason about this conditional distribution of the terminal states of the goal condition policy, right? Because remember this goal condition policy is very suboptimal, especially in the beginning of the reinforcement learning process, right? It's not gonna just uh, efficiently teleport to the goal you set it to. It, it can just end up anywhere. So really we care about this terminal state distribution as And then, how do, we, how do we figure out like if a good goal is good? Well, we're, we're saying a goal is good if the terminal state distribution induced by that goal will result in high explore, exploration value from the exploration policy, right? Because remember, we're like rolling out the exploration policy from these terminal states of the goal condition control. So in order to actually like optimize this objective, we need to compute this terminal state distribution, right? And that terminal state distribution, um, it's not easy to estimate, but you can estimate this by learning a like one step predictive model that basically like rolls out rolls out a trajectory um, with some like predicted dynamics, right? So we're calling that a world model, but it's just a dynamics model. And so like I'm going to give you a little bit more detailed analysis of the method. 
So first, like I said, we're just going to sample some gold candidates. So these can just be like from anywhere in the state space. Um, and the idea here is we're going to like use a world model so you can see the robots like thinking. So this is like using a learned dynamics model from its current data. It's going to unroll. So it's going to unroll the goal condition policy condition on like this orange star goal, for example, and say that it's going to land up at this terminal state. And then like, and then, you know, do the same thing for each goal candidate. So for this purple star, we're going to predict that's going to end up at this terminal state. Okay, now how do we actually like uh, score these? So zooming in on one of these uh, goal pairs, like the, the goal in the terminal state, we can see that for the purple one, um, the value function thinks that starting the goal, starting the exploration policy from this terminal state is like a good way to gather rewards because it's like near the edge of the frontier. Whereas uh, for the orange state, you can see that like, even though the, the goal for the orange state was like all the way out there, so it seems like a very good goal, it, uh, under prediction, we predict that the goal condition policy will like end up somewhere that's not good for exploration. So here we, we see that it's predicted to be bad. So what we do is we just choose the best goal with like the highest um with the highest exploration value for goal condition uh, exploration or ghost. So just to complete the like RL training loop, we generate goals with this uh, objective I just described. And then we're going to input that goal G into go explore exploration, which is like you first run the goal condition policy on this goal, and then you run the exploration policy. And then you record this entire episode in the replay buffer. And then we, we run a round of like RL. So we just uh, improve the world model, the policies, and the value functions on this uh, updated data set. And then, uh, yeah, and then we, we, with this updated, like, uh, updated world model and policy and value functions, we get even better goal generation. So it's like a positive feedback loop. Okay, um, I'm gonna be very quick here. So we just have some uh, experiments where we need to do hard exploration. So in the point maze, for example, like the agent spawns on the left, and then we're testing we're testing the goal condition policy on like uh, goals uh, on the top right hand side. So you can see like that 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 goal is like the hardest to reach from the bottom left. So you need very good exploration to learn how to get there. And maybe the block stacking case, like um, you have three blocks, and a naturally hard goal is to stack all three blocks into a tower. So I'm just gonna like, yeah, so basically we are the blue line. We are better than the other non-blue lines. Um, so the other so the other baselines do things like that, frontier, frontier-based exploration, or they they don't they don't do goal picking. But the point here is like um peg, like our method is picking goals that lead to better exploration. And we can tell we can tell that we're doing better because the goal condition policy trained off of our exploration data is actually able to reach these hard to reach goals, right? Okay, so I'm just going to skip this stuff, but um, I'm just going to focus on the block stacking experiment. So you can see, like, here's some examples of the uh, goal condition policy trained on our data. You can see that's actually able to stack uh, these three blocks. Um, and you can see what's happening in the exploration on the bottom is that, like, in the exploration episode itself, the um, go explore procedure, what it's doing is it's using the goal condition policy to, like, first stack the blocks. And then the exploration policy wants to, like, grow them out. Like, that's, like, the way to optimize exploration in this environment. So it's, so it's just like kind of interesting because I didn't expect the robot to like have to throw the blocks out of the table. Um, yeah, and just examining quickly like what the what kind of goals does like peg set. So like uh, the red stars. So the red stars are showing you like what kind of goals are picking in this like maze environment, and then the green dots are showing you like where the ant actually like moves in the maze. So you can see that like um, the if you look at uh, the baseline negative. Uh, so Mega is like picking goals with um, it's picking goals that are like seen. So it has to have seen it in the replay buffer before. They need to be reachable. So like the it, it needs to think that the goal condition policy can reach it. And they also need to be novel. So like even though you've seen it before, you shouldn't have seen it that much. So you can see that Mega is like prescribing some kind of like heuristic um, goal picking approach. Um, whereas like our method, we're just saying like we don't care about the goals at all. Like we don't care if they're seen, we don't care if they're reachable, we don't care if they're like high and novel. We're just going to pick goals so that when the ant is conditioned on those goals, it's going to like go somewhere that we can call them. So you can actually see here, like the goals that uh, Peg is picking, they're like kind of weird. So you can see that they're picking like stuff that's like inside the walls, um, picking things here. But it doesn't matter because you can see that the actual exploration of the method uh, like penetrates the maze more deeply than these frontier based uh, methods. Okay, so um, that's actually it. So I I just went through all the works. So like in all of these works, we design our algorithms that attend to like the right parts of the MVP. So I talked about attending to like maybe the spatial or perceptual parts of the, of the um, 
the NDP, like you only care about the world region, and, and that's like useful for transferring new robots. Maybe you uh, care about the reward function a lot, so you should do interactive perception to find more informative rewards. And finally, uh, if you if you don't even know the task in the first place, maybe you should do some kind of task discovery to see what kind of task can actually do in the market. And yeah, finally, like this is a very incomplete list of like what it means to find the right part. Maybe you guys will think of other ways to um, other other like parts of the MVP that you can uh, exploit to get more sample efficient RL. Um, and the main point of this talk is just to say uh, by doing this kind of focused learning, um, we will get RL policies that are much more data efficient than the traditional uh, like end to end RL approach. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ed, for your interesting and good talk. Um, if anyone has any questions, that's a question. Um, for, for PEG, when you're doing this, um, do you, uh, do you keep the explore policy like frozen? Um, yeah. No, we don't. Oh, so yeah, the explore right. policy is always being trained to find unseen states. Okay. Yeah. So I guess you're like, um, I guess there's sort of like two different like moving things, right? You're trying to choose a goal that's good for your like current explore policy. And then like also you're updating the explore policy to be, I guess, better in some way. Um, I guess that that, work, that works pretty well. That's yeah. actually a thing that you want, right? Yeah. Because like uh, the more data you see, then your exploration policy is uh, the object the objective is state like state novelty. So it's going to try to see even more unseen things. Um, yeah. So that can actually be a downside. So actually, we we have a problem of over exploration. Like we explore too much. So like for example, like uh, I showed you the robot like throwing the blocks out. Like that's a very interesting like trajectory to the exploration policy, but as a human, I probably don't want my robot to like start throwing stuff out, right? Like maybe my household robot will start like destroying stuff or ripping open the walls to see more unsafe states, right? So like there's definitely a, a so definitely like we have this problem of over exploration. Like safety is a pretty like pretty important factor to consider um, if you were to deploy this on a real world robot. Uh, yeah. Robot. When I say put a table, I don't mean like push everything off. Yeah, you can. Yeah, so uh, one way to do that is like in the design of the goal states. So like in your goal states, um, maybe you can have like velocity. You can have like velocities, so you can set goals that are. Um, so you can set goals that have like the uh, kitchen table with the object positions, but have their like velocity dimensions be zero. Um, but like I, I don't think this addresses it. At, Training time. Maybe that's what you're asking. Like, how to make sure the robot does like safe exploration. It doesn't. Yeah. So you can you can add constraints just through the reward function. So you can like penalize it for having high velocity behaviors. Right? So like the exploration policy, the objective right now is just to seek new states, basically. But we can also add a term that says uh, maybe don't like maybe uh, penalize high velocity states. Right. Um, but there is there is no like at least in RL, there's not a good way to like uh, encode hard constraints. Yeah, so that that is a problem. Yeah. Um, um so for the hour, um I'm just a little confused on how you're uh explaining the robot um like the interactive uh functions there. Like how are you how are you going to provide like uh scaling up the process? Um uh, are you asking about like how did I train the IRA or yeah, that that's the first question. And the next is like through tasks that are more complicated. Um, is that like how uh, is there a way you can scale that, or is the the task is relatively complicated tasks? So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. So for IRF, um, so to train the so to train the IRF policy, remember we're, what we're exposing to it is like an actionable example. So like a physical like door that may or may not be unlocked. So it doesn't actually know if it's locked or unlocked. And the objective is for the IRF policy to try to like play around with this door, for example. And then that trajectory should be very informative of, um, it, it should like from that trajectory of like playing around and interacting with the door, you should be able to uh, classify if the actionable example was uh, positive or negative. So like what that means is like um, in the locked door case or in the door that may be unlocked or locked, if like a way of doing this would be to attempt would be to like try to open the door because if the door was locked, then it wouldn't open, and if it was unlocked, it would open like completely. 
And that, like from those trajectories, you can very quickly tell, like if it belonged, if it was originally locked up. So you have a very defined. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Yeah. And then uh, you were asking about scaling, right? Yes. Yeah, so I think for scaling to a uh, higher pass, uh, maybe one problem that was pointed out was like this is a, like we assume the IRF, since it's doing interactive perception, it might alter the environment. Um, so then we're we're restricted to running it like once after the task policy has completed. We can't like run it in the middle of the execution. So like uh, to scale it to higher tasks, like we might need to think about how to do like dense rewards with IRF. And like maybe one potential way is to do interactive perception without like destroying the environment. So like you want to do like reversible interactive perception things like that. Yeah. But in terms of actual scaling, like um, you just need to provide more examples. Like it scales with the number of actual examples you can get. Um, so I think it does scale the data quite, quite well. It's just like the actual act of like acquiring an actual example might be expensive. Like I might not have a factory that produces locked doors, right? Uh, I might need a human to lock it. Uh, in the last slide, uh, you don't consider the action phase. So I was wondering, can you comment on the impact of uh, abstraction of your actions? And if you consider, maybe to learn some action abstraction. Uh, uh, for which? For which? For exploration. For exploration. Yeah. yeah, I think um, action space is huge, right? Like the more high level your action space is, um, like, I, like in general, the lower, the, lower, uh, the lower level your action space is, the harder it might be to do exploration and um for example on the block stacking example we we are doing stuff with like a position based control so like how just moving the end effect of a position and if, if and it might be interesting if we had access to like uh, very low level control like quarks because then we can get more dexterous manipulation or even higher level like motion planning for um i think the main the main problem with uh using abstracted action spaces is the assumption of access to such like action spaces, right? Like um, I'm like in this like uh in this paper, I try to work with like no assumptions. So like I don't assume access to a higher level uh, action space or controller. Um, but actually, one thing you can think about is like for PEG, the method is running a goal condition policy. And the goal condition policy itself is basically primitive. That's like trying to achieve a goal, right? So it is actually you can view it as a form of action abstraction. Um, I'm not sure if I answered your question. I just, yeah, yeah. just commenting on action space in general. Yeah. Um, I think we're out of time, but uh, so. I just have a question for Peg. Um, how much time did it add to time after operation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a, a big disadvantage of model based RL. So, like, uh, model based RL creates off. So, like, basically, you get a lot of data efficiency. So, the number of environmental interactions you need is very low compared to model free RL, but it takes a lot longer to actually like train this giant world model, right? So for example, uh, it takes 48 hours to train this, uh, to train this uh, robot to stack three blocks, which is like a long time. And alternatively, I could have run the model free RL for 48 hours. Um, so the model free RL, let me see, I can just show you. So like you can see here that um, in the block second graph, it's, it's 1 million steps, right? So if I ran model free RL for 48 hours, I would get like, one billion steps or something. So it's like a lot faster to run. But even I, I have tried that. So I have run model free RL for like one billion steps in 48 hours. But the problem is model free RL is just not as example efficient and you can't do as many like sophisticated exploration techniques. Right. Because here, like here I because I have this old model, I can do this kind of like fancy prediction to figure out what are good goals to set. And just because you have like model free RL that can like run really fast, it doesn't mean the exploration is good, right? So it, it really depends on your MVP. So if an MVP is where exploration is easy and you can like simulate it, just use model free RL. Um, but here, like the exploration, these environments, the exploration is very hard. So like having sample efficiency is a lot better than having um, fast wall times. Let's thank Ed again for his yeah, Thank you, guys.